So, we are, we are going to, to continue to, to see what we, seen, uh, we have seen uh, one month ago about uh, IPv6. So, what we have seen at the beginning was, I think, very useful for your practicals because you, you have seen uh, technique like uh, MPLS, uh, 6P, etc. Et so, what we are going to, to see right now will be maybe more useful in the uh, near future. So uh, we are going to, so I remember, I remind you what we, we have seen. It was that to put IPv6 inside a core network was not that difficult because we can use MPLS to do it. But it just, what we have seen is that you can forward the information very quickly inside a router but an address is not only that. An address is used for many, many other things. And that's the problem with uh, to introduce IPv6, is that if it was only forwarding, it will be very easy. But in fact, an address is used or uh, is can be given by some tools, for example, a radio server or things like this. And so you, you need to, to have this inside your network, in, 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 into your information system, not only inside your router. And here it's a little bit more difficult to, to install. So we are going to see uh, this. And we, if, we if you remember what we, we saw last time, here we have the vision of the world given by the V6OP uh, working group at the ITF, which divide the the, wo the world in different parts. So you have ISP. On ISP, the problem is, of course, transit, peering. But we have also to see access. And right now, we don't have a very closely look into access. And in fact, what is blocking right now to, to have IPv6 is that we don't find providers that give you IPv6 access. And um, at the beginning of the month, the 8th of June, we had the V6 day. So this day, some uh, service, some content provider offer their server into IPv6. For example, you can access to Facebook in IPv6. You can access to Google in IPv6. But if you look at the traffic on the backbone, it was still very, very low. Because, in fact, users don't get IPv6 on their client. So if you have some, if IPv6 is missing somewhere between the server and the client, then you continue to do it in IPv4. So, and of course, if Facebook and Google was active, normally a lot of traffic goes to that site. And when I say Google, it's YouTube, it's uh, all these things. So it means that the missing factor now is the access and we are going to see how we can improve the access so this is one possibility the other possibility is a company network so where to put ipv6 into the company network so from my personal point of view it's not necessary to put ipv6 everywhere in a company network because you have still a lot of missing uh, things to put IPv6 everywhere, so you have to be careful and give your interface into the outside world in IPv6. But inside your company, you can continue to use IPv4 because you have all the management tools that are used for, for that. And you have to wait that the market will be more ready with security tools, with uh, other things, to, uh, to you have a complete IPv6 network into your company. Another part where it's quite different, it's uh, unmanaged network. Because unmanaged network is what you have in your home. Even if now you are a uh, network expert, you know everything about uh, uh, IP and how to configure devices. You, uh, most of the people are, doesn't know how to use it, so they buy a box and put it on the network and it has to work. So it's the kind of things we, you, we find at home or in small offices where you don't have a network manager that can do uh, all the configuration. 
And here, it will be easier to install IPv6 when we will have the access because we have some auto configuration tools that are uh, available in IPv6. Yes? Yes, more or less, or from your provider that buy a box and give it to you with your access. You can ask, but I don't know if your ISP will give it to you. In fact, there is different models. For example, in, in France, the, normally the box doesn't belong to you, but belongs to your ISP. So it means that when they want to change something, they say, OK, give me back the old box, and I will give you a new one. And in this new one, you will have the new uh, functionalities. So I think in Mexico, it's almost the same. When you buy uh, an access from uh, Telmex, you got a box on the Telmex can, if you have a trouble with your box, you can uh, change it. In the US and other part of the world, normally the box belongs to you. So you go to Office Depot or, and you buy a router and you put it in your home. So in that case, of course, if you want to put IPv6 in it, it will be a little bit more complex because one possibility to, is to have a software update of your box with a new release, but it's still, it's always a risky procedure because you have to find a good re release for the good product, and during uh, one minute you have to pray that everything goes right, because if something fails, you may lose your box. So maybe if you are not a hacker, you will not do it. So you will have to buy another product. So that's. Um, um, Something that de depends on how the market is made and if the box belongs to the provider or not. And uh, the other part, so home unmanaged network, and you have cellular networks, and cellular networks is, uh, and I will not talk about that, but the Xavier Lagrange made some talk about LTE, and you have seen that in LTE, IPv6 is mandatory. So it means that in the new release, you will be in IPv6 and you will have, by some chance, IPv4 for compatibility reasons. So it means that here we will see that the new generation include IPv6. The one thing that is missing in uh, this document and on this uh, slide is new services. Here I am still in the comment usage of the internet it means that I want to get a web page or, or read a mail but there is nothing new. For new services like Internet of Things so we will talk about that this afternoon and you got already the, uh, the, the two-day seminar in, uh, in at the end of May you have seen that we talk only about IPv6 we say nothing about IPv4, or if we have IPv4, it's in the access, but the sensor by itself, the device, uh, the thing, will be in IPv6. And then maybe you have some transition way to get it from IPv4, but mainly it will be IPv6. Same thing, last week you we got a presentation from uh, Gérard Lolan about uh, Vanet. So Gérard Lolan stay at uh, layer 2, but if you go at layer 3, it's IPv6. Because the time this system will go to cars, everybody will be in IPv6. So we will have two networks, legacy things that have to remain in IPv4 because you have a lot of, lot of applications that continue to run only in IPv4, but for new things, it will be directly in IPv6. And I will show you some uh, way to, to do that and have both uh, of the network. So if we go to 
ISP, access network. So one, one solution, for example, you want to test IPv6 for your project. So you have three possibilities. One, which is the best way to do it, is to get a native connectivity. It means that you go to uh, your lab and you are dual stack in IPv4 and IPv6. And you do your project in IPv6. So if you are at Telecom Bretagne, you're lucky, it works. In At ETAM, it's not the case, but maybe in one year, you will have IPv6. So it will not be a problem. Too. But in some company where you have strict security rules, it will be very difficult to, to get that. So one possibility is to use tunnels. As we saw, tunnels for core network. We can have also tunnels for access. And here it's not so bad to use tunnels because here we don't care about the performances. It means that the throughput will be quite limited. Let's say that you have an access at 20 megabit per second. So a tunnel will not create a bottleneck as it may create inside a core network where you have very high speed links. So here tunnel is a good way to, to get the connectivity. So one solution is to have automatic tunnels. So it means that you don't do anything. You start your routers and you got a tunnel. But it doesn't work all the time. We are going to see uh, 624, which is now uh, almost obsolete mechanism. But 624 can create automatically a connectivity. If you have some Windows computer, you may have 624 that run automatically on your system and get offer you an IPv6 connectivity. Not the router. But if you have a public address, and it's not the case here, but if you are, for example, at ETAM, you have an IPv4 public address, and so you may have 624 automatically set up on your computer. And this way, you will get an IPv6 connectivity. But it will be totally independent of your network manager at ETAM. It's just some IPv4 packet that goes on the network, but these IPv4 packets carry IPv6 connectivity. So it's a device type ready to work uh, automatically in IPv6? Yes, they will work in IPv6, but the problem is that the quality of this automatic tunnel is not so good. So it means that if you are using them, you may have a bad quality compared to IPv4. And that's a, that's a big problem. We are going to, uh, to see why. And the other solution is to use configure tunnels. tunnels. And configure tunnels means that here you know you have configured something, and so it's not automatic. And maybe you can select how the tunnel is built. And this way, you can manage the, the connectivity and the quality of service. So one way is, for example, to use tunnel broker. So this is a very popular way to do it uh, in a company that wants to test IPv6. For example, you, your company, and you give some uh, internship to an internship. OK, you have to test our product in IPv6. Of course, the intern will say, I don't have IPv6. Say, OK, you start a tunnel broker in some restricted area of your network. So you, how does it work? You go to a website, and you register yourself. You give your, you give your name, your identity, etc. The, um, the IP address of, for example, of your router, IP for address of your router. And then this will configure a router inside the IPv6 provider net, uh, network and give you the configuration of your router. And this way, you can get an IPv6 access, connectivity. And then, after that, you can test IPv6 connectivity.
So this is a, a good way to, to have not good quality access, but uh, you have a not so bad quality here, and you are able to, to start to test your, your products. Of course, this cannot be used in uh, real production. Uh, we should not be used in production network because you don't have any guarantee of, uh, of quality, quality. So this is one solution. Another solution is not to go through a web server to configure that, but try to have these two uh, devices to, the, to, to connect themselves. So this is one possibility and is for example, something that is used in uh, France by uh, Nof Telecom to get IPv6 connectivity inside their um, IPv4 network. So Nof Telecom is like France Telecom. It's an ADSL provider. And they propose here a nine box or Nof box. And here, of course, they have an IPv4 infrastructure. So what does, have they done? They have establish a L2TP tunneling that goes to a special router here and then this router is connected to IPv6. But in the middle here you have just two forward IPv4 packets. So we are going to see uh, how it works and it's based on a, on a project we, we have done. So here you have a network of course an IPv4 network with your CPE and you cannot change in that case the CPE because the CPE uh, is a box somewhere, a black box and you don't have access to the software so, so you cannot change it. The problem is that your CPE is genera generally a NAT so when you are doing a, a NAT, you remember how it works you have your IPv4 packet and then you expect to have a layer 4. So this layer 4 can be UDP, TCP, SCTP and what you have on the top at the beginning of your layer 4 you have source port and destination port. In, if I am doing a tunnel I will put an IPv6 packet inside an IPv4 packet. So what happens here is that I have not, I don't have source port or destination port at the beginning. So my NAT will not work. So that's a problem. The other problem is that any equipment, any piece of equipment that is inside the local area network doesn't know the global address of the network. This just sees a private address. So that's also uh, a problem. So, here, suppose that we have this, uh, this network and we don't want to change anything to the CPE because the CPE is totally closed. We cannot have new services and the CPE hide us the connection with the provider network. We don't have information coming from the provider. So how we do that? We have here, you put another access, another router, and this router will be for IPv6. So in, instead of putting transition mechanism inside a PC, you put this on another router. And this router will add some functionality to the CPU. So how it works now? Then we use L2TP tunneling. So what is L2TP? L2TP is something that is generally used in ADSL network. So in ADSL network, what, we do you, what do you have? You have your DSLAM. 
And from your this lamp to the home, you create a PPP tunnel generally over ATM. Okay, and you know what is PPP? Point-to-point -point protocol. And this protocol has some good property. For example, at the beginning, I have to authenticate myself. So I receive a challenge from the DSLAM, and I have to answer to that challenge. And then the DSLAM will ask for some uh, auto authentication server to see if I am the person I pretend to be. So how does it work? On the response, you have the ID ident I put my identity. I recopy. I copy again the challenge, and I put a response, which is a hash, hash of the challenge plus a secret. So I don't send the secret, but I send. So the DSLAM send this information to the server, authentication server, what we call generally triple A, and uh, then I have an answer, OK or not. And then, if it's OK, I have a positive answer. So that's the beginning of a PPP session. So you cannot enter directly in a PPP se session. You have to authenticate yourself. Then you will negotiate which protocol you want to put on your PPP session. So you can say, I want to do IPv4. And you say, I want to do IPv6. And then for both of these protocols, you are able to configure parameters. For example, in IPv4, you will be able to get your IP address. So the address you will put in your box, and that will be used to NAT uh, packets coming from your, from, your, from your home. You can get also the DNS server, etc., etc. So plenty of information. In IPv6, it's a little bit more limit. Uh, you have more limitation because you can just put link to link. You can just negotiate link to link addresses. But uh, link local, sorry. Uh, you can just negotiate link local addresses. And when you have negotiated that, then you use DHCPv6 to get more information. So what we can do here? So. Here it's for IPv4 using a DSLAM. And what you can do in some area, it's here you have internet. But in fact, in the DSLAM, you don't connect directly to the internet. What you want to go is to connect to another provider. And this provider will give you access to the internet. So for example, here, I am in Telmex network. So I am using telephone wire from Telmex. And here, I am in Telmex IP network. But in fact, I prefer another provider to get access. So in that case, what will do Telmex is to take my PPP frame and continue to forward it in the IP network. And to do that, we need a protocol. And this protocol is called L2TP for layer 2 tunnel protocol. So layer 2 is PPP. So in that case, what happens? I can authenticate myself with this provider and not with Telmex. So what we are going to, to do is to extend this to the home. Normally, you see it's more in a DSLAM, but you, you have this kind of feature. And here, what we are going to do is to continue the tunnel to the home, to put a CPE here, for example, IPv6. And what will happen, you continue to use Telmex to get access to IPv4. And that's the only thing Telmex is uh, able to do. This is just uh, 
example. And if you want IPv6 connectivity, then you will go to another provider. Of course, here we are no more forwarding or switching PPP frame, but here is just IP packet from my CPE to this provider. Okay? So, what are the advantages of L2TP? It's like a VPN, but what, is, what are the advantages of L2TP? First, L2TP is based on IPv4, in that case, UDP, and if I have UDP here, it means that I can have a NAT traversal capability because I can create a context. So if I send periodically some packets here, then it will be I will be able to maintain my NAT context in the CPV4. And this way, I can be reachable at any time both by this device. OK? So when I do that, First thing, so after UDP, I have L2TP. So it's some bits, but it's not very important. And then I have on the top PPP. And with PPP, I have authentication capability. So it means that here, in that case, I can authenticate a user, be sure that this user exists, and, for example, go to triple A to see uh, to log that is it has been connected, and I know that at this time this user has been connected, and I can give him a prefix that is related to his to its identity. So, in that case, I will use DHCP v6 prefix delegation. And I will give him its global prefix. By doing that, since I have authenticated the user, I will give, always give to him the same global prefix. So here you have always the same IPv6 address or prefix. Even if your provider is not the case in Mexico but in France, your provider is changing every day or every three days its IPv4 address. So we don't care here. If you change the IP for address, the tunnel will be down, and we will create another tunnel. So what's the advantage of this uh, technique? It's that we do not create, invent, standardize any new protocols. We just use what is existing today. Of course, this is done on IPv6 and not in IPv4, so you will may, may find some bugs, but you don't have to change anything on the, what you, you have. So here you have the uh, uh, advantage, so that means that now your devices here has a double address, one in IPv4, one in IPv6, and the one in uh, IPv6 will be sent to this box, the blue box, and then the blue box will tunnel the IP4 packet, and the IP4 packet will be sent to that uh, device here in the ISP network. If you are talking in IPv4, you talk directly with UCP. So this way you add IPv6 functionality to your network, but with putting transition mechanism or equipment in near your router, not on your laptop. For example, if you want to do that on your laptop, it means that your laptop has to stay on all the time, which is not always the case. Here is just a device that does consume a lot of uh, energy. So this is one advantage, and of course I talk about um, the, the nerve box. What is the next step? Is to put this functionality not outside of the CPE v4, but to merge CPE v4 and 
TPV6, and this way you have only one access, one device. So that's uh, something interesting, of course. It's a little bit heavy because you have a lot of encapsulation. You have UDP, L2TP, PPP, and then IPv6. So you add some overhead here. This is about, I think, if my memory is good, it's about 18 bytes that you add for that. So of course, your mid MTU has to be uh, limited by uh, here, uh, five, uh, 58 bytes, because you have to add the 40 bytes of UDP, of IPv4. So it's much more than IPv6 just on top of IP IPv4. So this is uh, one, uh, one drawback. The other thing is that, of course, you have to put all the mechanism, authentication of the user, et cetera, et cetera, on a separate way, gateway. So maybe if we look, for example, so here I have a CPE that is V4 and V6. And I put in my network somewhere here my uh, L2TP server, what we you call LNS, here, that is connected to IPv6. So I may have the same AAA database. So when I'm logging in IPv4, I query it that way. And when I'm logging in IPv6, I send a query to it from here. So I can maybe have only one database to manage all the users. But it means that I have to do it. So it has a cost. Sorry, uh, Yes? What is the purpose of this database? It's to authenticate yourself. So when you log to the network, you receive a challenge. It's a random number. And you answer to that random number with using a secret. So the secret is shared by you and by the database. So when you log, you receive this challenge, you answer to it, and the answer is sent to the triple A that will say OK or not. So if it's OK, you open the IPv4 gate. And the provider may use it also, this to log you, and to make, uh, to make you pay money. Because if you are connected one hour, one hour you can pay one hour of connection. So you have this, in, if you remember, in LTE or in uh, IMS, you have also this uh, AAA database. So what, once you have done that, you, have, you open the IPv4 door, and now you have to establish IPv6 connectivity. So it means that this one will send a challenge. So here it's LNS, or what we call also software air concentrator. So this one now has to authenticate you. So it's changed a secret. You response here. It's a new challenge, so you have a new response. And then you ask the database, is this guy allowed to connect to IPv6? If it's the case, then you will receive OK. And then we can continue the procedure to uh, give you a prefix, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Yes? L -N -S? LNS, yes. L2TP, uh, L2TP network server or something like this. So you have, in uh, L2TP, you have uh, LAC, which is a client part, L2TP access uh, client, and LNS, L2TP network server. And in the software vocabulary, this is called a software, uh, software initiator, so you say, I want to connect to IPv6, and here is a software concentrator. But forget about this vocabulary, you can say just a L2TP client and L2TP server. Okay, so, 
This way, you can little by little change things. So here I have only IPv4 at the beginning. Then I introduce IPv6 by putting IPv6 outside of my box and inside my box, but I continue to have an IPv4 network. Then th the next step is to have a DSLAM that can be able to manage IPv6. And if it's the case, then I just do both IPv4 and IPv6 on the same PPP connection. So this is uh, one solution for a provider to, to move to, to IPv6. And you see that here, the more, most complex part is to allocate you an IPv6 prefix. So we, we need some tools to, to do that. So this is uh, one solution. So software, of course, is not something uh, new, because we already have to talk about the mesh problem, where you have you will use software to put IPv4 on an IPv6 cloud using MPLS. So here it's another solution. So we'll continue to talk about software uh, solution in, in the following slide because they have also developed other way to, to do some session. Okay, so now in manage network, how I can put IPv6. There is different ways. One is to, to look at, um, so we can talk about um, that in the future, but normally you will not have a problem of addresses in your company network. You have uh, a 10 slash 8 network in your company. And so with that, you can have about uh, 2 million users or 2 million pieces of equipment. So this will be enough for your company. So the lack of IPv4 address is not a problem for you. It's a problem for providers, but not for companies. So what you will do? Why do you need to play with IPv6? For several reasons. The first one is that IPv6 will be there in mm, maybe uh, five years. So you have to be ready to, to use IPv6 and you, you have to prepare yourself to IPv6 by thinking to a way to address devices in your network. So how I will do the print service, how I, what how I will be the address, how I will manage firewalls. So you have to, what, to put what you are doing now in IPv4 to IPv6, and you have to imagine some, some solutions, some addressing plan. Maybe you have to rearrange your network, because your network in IPv4 was built because you, have, you buy this company, and this company was using this and this. So you put things together but it's not working very well, or it's not very clean. So you have to, to think of that when you want to, to put IPv6. For example, you may say, okay, telephony, IP telephony in my network, in my company is a big mess because I have some to cross NATs, etc. So maybe the first service I want to move is uh, the SIP, because on IPv6 it will be simpler to, to manage. So, you have to, to think of that, but, yes? Uh, just one question. Uh, maybe, what, what, what is your vision? Maybe in two years, three years, when all the companies start using IPv6, when will be the, the steps, or when will be the, the first uh, applications or, or, or issues that the company will have? Maybe that one that you are, that you are mentioning, uh, the, maybe the, the telephony will be the first one. The second one maybe will be the applications that because some of them will be in IPv6. I don't know 
which is the steps, uh, telephony, application, databases? Um, okay, so we, uh, normally I have that at the end, but we can see right now. So if you are a company network, for me, the most important thing is to m have an interface with the outside world in IPv6. So it means that you must have a web server that talks IPv6. You must have mail that will be able, must be able to work in IPv6. And this kind of service you are offering outside has to be dual stack. So this is one result of the V6 day. It's that this is possible. It means that the good thing about V6 day is that Facebook put IPv6, Google put IPv6, you have CDN, so Content Delivery Network, but where in IPv6, and what happens the 8th of June? Nothing. You didn't complain. So this is a very important result. Because it means that if we put IPv6 on the network, IPv4 customer will dot, don't complain, will not complain. It will work. So it means that if you put www.mycompany.com, you put in the DNS, the IP4 address and the IPv6 address, it will work. You don't penalize your IPv4 customers. So that's something very important because it means that you can uh, right now either configure your web server in IPv4 and IPv6 or use some tricks. We will see. Uh, you have already seen some of them during the practicals. So to use a proxy, for example, to get IPv6 traffic and to transform it into IPv4 to get to your server. Same thing for your mail. So it means that here you have, of course, to have a DNS that allow you to get to give IPv6 addresses. So that's the first element you have to introduce. But this thing is for many, many years, you already have a DNS server in your company that run IPv6. Or that be able to carry IPv6. So it's not a problem for you. Here you don't just have to configure it, but you don't have to change anything. Then, either to install a dual stack or some reverse proxies to, get to give IPv6 connectivity. And that's all. You block everything here. And inside your company, for your information um, uh, database or everything back office, you continue to run it in IPv4 using private address. If you do that, it will be quite good because this way you offer to your customer IPv6 connectivity. So if your customer is, for example, uh, in uh, Asia and is a service provider that only offer IPv6 connectivity, he will be able to connect to your server. As, as you know, the, right now, the companies are moving to, to the uh, cloud. cloud computing. So this is another, another priority for the company. I mean, maybe it will be the third, right? So for cloud computing, it's currently a lot we uh, maybe we have uh, we have a project with a company that uh, wants to put services in IPv6 in cloud computing. So we have a look at uh, different uh, uh, provider of cloud computing, and very few of them are offering IPv6. So currently, they just offer IPv4. But what we uh, can do? Cloud computing is a big big word, but what you see at the end is a Linux machine. And in this Linux machine, you have, in the kernel, you have IPv6 connectivity uh, drivers. So for example, in Amazon Cloud, you can have IPv6. Of course, all the network here is 
in IPv4. So since the network is in IPv4, normally you are not able to connect to IPv6. So what have, you, uh, what have we done for that? First thing is that this machine is connected to a 6P, uh, to a software. L2 TP server and here we have put a software initiator or L2, T L2 TP uh, server client so this way we are, you, we are using IPv4 we have some NAT somewhere in the cloud but we don't care we can cross it and this way we can allocate a prefix from Telecom Bretagne to the cloud computer and then here we are using open VPN because here we have the same problem if we want to connect to customers here we are using I private addresses so it's very difficult to control things so normally what you do you start a VPN for example uh, SSL uh, VPN so with open VPN and you give uh, an address to a customer and you use this address so here what you can do is to use IPv6 and IPv4 on the, BP, on the VPN. And so this way you can give IPv6 connectivity to your, your customer, even if your cloud is IPv4 only. So that's not a problem if you want. So here is not right now for production. It's just to test because the company we are working with is developing new products and this company wants to know if these products are will work in IPv6 so of course we have to test the stack here and we have to to test all the element but we can do it right now even with the Amazon cloud is only IPv4 so this is one possibility by putting all these things together but if you uh, are doing cloud computing maybe you can continue to do it in IPv4 you are not obliged to do that what is important is that your customer what you offering to outside is in IPv6 or is in dual stack IPv4 and IPv6 now you can start new services or move some services from one protocol to another one for example, the voice over IP is something that will benefit the most of IPv6. Because if you're in your company, you have a lot of NAT inside your company because you bought one company, another one, they have the same addressing plan, etc. So you put NATs here. If you are using IPv6, you avoid NATs on all the trouble you have with NATs on voice over IP. So maybe the VLAN for voice over IP can be the first one that will move to IPv6 but of course this will be possible only if your telephone your IP phone can move to IPv6 because if right now you say okay I'm gonna change all my telephone in my company and I will make a, a call to the market and say which which company gives me the best price for voice over IP to the telephone so you you have to describe and say IPv6 is mandatory so this is the first thing you have to do in your companies to be sure that now the products you are going to buy are IPv6 compatible that's something very important but that's not enough because a lot of vendors will say, okay, my product is IPv6 compatible. Look, you can do a ping on it and you have an answer. So, uh, and I have a very nice logo on it that says that it's IPv6 ready, so don't worry. We are IPv6 compatible. But for example, if you are looking at test about, about voice over IP, to have the IPv6 ready logo is not enough because IPv6 ready logo is just the IPv6 stack is not the SIP stack so you can have an IPv4 SIP stack and 
a kernel that, because you have Linux normally on, under it, and Linux is IPv6. Okay, but not your application. So you have to be very careful. And what is very important inside your company is to test. You are, for example, as I said uh, last time, at Telecom Bretagne, you don't have IPv6 in Wi-Fi networks because the products are not able to co manage correctly IPv6, even if it was written. So you have to be very careful and do tests about that because it's new. So it's new, so some vendors will cheat you and say, OK, we are IPv6 just for commercial reasons, but they don't. I've read it because customer, they say, my customer will never see it because they will not use it. And of course, it's a new product, new protocol, so you will have bugs. So you have to test. That's something important. But you have to do it because if you don't do it right now, in three years, when you say, OK, uh, I'm creating a new subsidiary in, um, in Asia, for example, and I want to connect, and oh, it's IPv6, and here we are not IPv6 then we have trouble. So in that case, if you prepare this, it will be easier because you already have think about an addressing plan. You will know that this product has some, uh, this firewall is IPv6 compatible, but you don't use it right now because it was not necessary. And after, when it will be needed, it will be here. So that's something important. But first thing is, internal outside interface with the world and here be prepared but don't change anything because from my personal point of view you cannot manage very easily an IPv6 network from an administrative a network manager or you have to put a DHCP server and force your customer your client your user to connect using DHCP, etc., but it's not so easy to, to manage. So that's why, and you will still always have some problem. My printer is only IP, IP4 only. How can I do? We can do it by using uh, some spooler, but you may have some trouble somewhere. So I don't think the market is really ready for moving everything to IPv6 right now. But uh, be prepared. So, and of course, here it's something important is that we want the same quality in IPv4 and IPv6. If you're a network manager and say, okay, I move to IPv6, but you cannot do this, this, and this, and you have to wait two hours be before getting your web page, but it's in IPv6, I don't think you, uh, your customer will like you. So you have to, to have the same. Uh, same capability. Of course, it will cost you money, not because you have to re reinvest in new products. Maybe you uh, we have to do it, but mostly because you have to train yourself, train your employee or your network manager to do that. So, of course, it has a cost. And you have to test devices, see how you, you put that, and, uh, and sometimes you may have some certification in IPv4, but no certification in IPv6. It's uh, in the bank industry, it's the case. When you have some router, they say, okay, this router is uh, certified for the bank, but in IPv4. And when you want to do it in IPv6, you have to, to do certification again. So here is what we say. So be ready though, so get IPv6, connectivity and prefix. Think about your addressing plan and start to deploy. So my personal view is that the best way is just to put it outside and don't try at the beginning to put it inside. But then little by little, when you are sure that everything works well, then you can start to put some server in IPv6 inside your company to see about some group of customer or user may, uh, may react. Okay, so 
a way to, to get IPv6 connectivity, we have seen that you, you can use tunnel broker, you can use software, but there is a very cheap way to, to do it, is to use a mechanism called 624. And what is 624? It's something very, very simple. First, what we are going to do is to create an IPv6 prefix based on an IPv4 address. So by doing that, we don't care about all the stuff, authentication, management, because everything is in the IPv4 address. So we don't have to add this into IPv6 because it's already present in IPv4. So by doing that, what we can do? For example, here we have two, two companies or two users that are behind the router, and this router is connected to the ISP. What we want, we want to do is to have IPv6 that runs automatically. So 624 is a mechanism that has been developed for shy people that doesn't want to ask about IPv6 connectivity. So it has to be uh, almost automatic. So how it works? Here, so in the, in the bottom, you have this router, this router, and this router get 1234 as IPv4 address. So we are going to create an IPv6 address which is the concatenation of 2002, which is a dedicated prefix to 6024, uh, and the 32-bit of the IP address. So the magic of 624 is that this is 16 plus 32 equals 48. So it can be viewed as a normal global prefix used in, IPv in IPv6. So by doing that, I have an official prefix that I can use inside my company. And this way, I can use it to send traffic. So of course, I use the same routine uh, prefix management. So uh, for example, neighbor discovery to allocate prefixes inside my company. And here, I have a PC that have, let's say, 2002, 01, 02, 03, So this is a global prefix. One has a subnet, and column, column one, for example, has the interface ID. So this packet will be routed to a default router. And this default router has to send the packet to the destination. So here, for example, I am sending a packet, sorry, I forgot here to say that, I'm sending a packet for, for example, 02, 2002, uh, 02, 03, 04, 05, column, column 1, sorry, 1, column, column 1. So this packet is routed in IPv6 inside my network, arrive to a border router, and this border router has to continue to forward the packet. The problem is that outside, so here it's IPv6, and here it's only IPv4. So what will I do is to create a tunnel. Now what will be the address to encapsulate the packet. So it will be my IP address given by my provider, 1234. And the destination will be taken from the IPv6 destination. And so I know that here I have an IPv4 address. So I will send it to 2.3.4.5. 
The packet will arrive to this router, 624 router, and this router will remove the IP4 encapsulation and forward internally the IPv6 packet. So here, with 624, I have solved two problems. One is that I don't have to ask my provider for an IPv6, IP, IPv6 prefix because I can use my own one, my homemade prefix, built on an IPv4 address. And to send the traffic to that destination, I don't need IPv6 connectivity because inside the prefix, I have the information to forward to uh, tunnel it in IPv4. So that's magic. And that works well, at least when you are in a 6 to 4 network. Because now, if I want to talk not to a 6 to 4 address, but I want to talk to 2001 6, uh, 60 73 1 1 column column 1. So here it's a pure IPv6 address. And here, of course, I cannot send it in IPv6 because this provider is only IPv4. This provider gives me, a 624 gives me an IPv6 identity based on IPv4, but I don't have a connectivity. So to avoid that, to solve this problem, then people will install relays on the internet. And what will hap happen is if I receive here a 624 prefix, I can use the 624 interface. And when it's something else, so the default route, then I will send it to a well-known 624 address. So 2002, etc. And of course, in this 624 address, I have here the IPv4 address where I can send it in IPv4. So here I will send it, this packet, to a relay. The relay will remove the IPv4 header and send it natively in IPv6 to the destination. OK? So this is one possibility. And of course, the answer will be by another relay. So this relay here can say, I can carry 6 to 4 traffic. So 2002 slash 16. And so the server is close to that one. So this will answer, say that it starts with two, the, VA, the destination starts with 2002. So the packet will arrive here. And then we will create a tunnel to that router. So now suppose that you are you want to connect to my computer. My computer in that room is connected to the IPv6 network of Telecom Bretagne. But you you are connected to an IPv4 network at Telecom Bretagne. So what can happen is that your packet will be sent to a relay and then the relay will send it to me. So we are in the same room but maybe we have to go to Canada or to Germany or Switzerland to find a relay and then come back. So it will give you a very bad quality of service. So that's a big problem of uh, this kind of mechanism that, are, that start automatically. So for example, you, you have your windows. Your window will start automatically 624. And you will want to talk with my laptop. And you, you will use 624. And you will have a bad quality. Now, another person that will have only IPv4 on his laptop will use the IP4 address to contact me. So what happened? 
It happens that here I have a better quality with IPv4 than with IPv6. And that's something that is a big problem because if you start a service in IPv4, in IPv6, your customer may experience a bad quality compared to a competitor that stay in IPv4. So for example, if Microsoft, if uh, Windows, if Google start is uh, put an IPv6 address in its web page, then if you have 624 on your computer, you will say, okay, I have very bad quality with Google. If I'm going to Bing, I, I experience a better quality, but in fact, Bing is only in IPv4. So it means that if you are a, a content provider, you may hesitate to enable IPv6. So that's one reason we, we had the six day. So the six day proved that if you are running IPv6 on your network, then a very, very low percentage of user may have trouble with IPv6. But the mass, vast majority, it will not create any trouble. So that's why 6 to 4 is a mechanism that is pushing away from the internet because it's a good transition mechanism or a good way to test IPv6. But since you don't get good results, you will normally, your first reaction is to say, okay, I stop IPv6 on my computer. So as a transition mechanism is not a good mechanism. So, but there is a guy called Rémi Desprez, so a French guy, that developed a new version of 624, and he called it 6RD. So RD doesn't mean Rémi Desprez. It's, uh, if you think that, it's totally stupid. In fact, it's rapid deployment. And in fact, Rémi Desprez wanted to, to find a, a mechanism to, to push IPv6. And he said, instead of putting 2002 on the IPv4 address, so this is a, a good solution to get a slash 48. But for example, if I'm a, custom, uh, I'm a provider, an ISP, and I have already I have a prefix, for example, a prefix with a length of 30, if, uh, or 28, it would be better, a length of 28. If I add, after that, an IPv4 address, so 32 bit, I will have a slash 60. And with a slash 60, it remains 4 bits to number subnet ID. And what is the difference between 624 and, uh, and 6RD is that with 6RD, I don't have, in 624, I have plenty of relays on the internet. And the problem of these relays is that they are mostly outside of my provider network. And I have some routings that is not very good because I will select the closer to my computer, then I will go to a server, and the server will select the closer to its computer. So I have a path that is not well managed, and this may lead also to a very long path. So with 6RD, it's not the case. I put 6RD inside my provider network. So that's the difference. You so it's the provider that offers you the service. And it will create tunnels to its customers. So its customer will continue to have an IPv4 address. And this is the normal way to allocate IPv4 address. So you have the management of this IPv4 address. If a judge 
come and say, this guy has done some bad things. I know this IP address. Give me its identity. I can do it on IPv4. Now, what will I do is to put my prefix, my provider prefix, IPv6 prefix, and then the IPv4 address and get, for example, a slash 60 and allocate it to the user. So the, here, my box will know the IPv4 address of this gateway, of this router, IPv6 router. And here, from outside, all the internet packet will be routed to this device because here is a prefix of my provider. So in instead of put going on unknown relays, you make all the traffic converge to some gateways, well-known gateways, and here you have the shorted path. Shorted path here in IPv4 because it's only in your customer network, or your in uh, provider network, sorry. And here, shorted path outside because it's a normal IPv6, is you as a normal IPv6 prefix. And what you can do also is but if two customers are talking together using this prefix, you don't go to the relay, but they talk directly. So that was the proposal of Rémi Després. And he wanted France Telecom to move and to put IPv6 in its network very quickly. So the best way he thought to, to push that is to go to a competitor of France Telecom. And he went to C3. So maybe now you know a little bit more the French market of uh, ADSL, but you have three uh, providers, one or at least three main providers. One is France Telecom, the other one is SFR North, and the last one is Free. And so he went to C3 with this proposal. So it was very easy to install because here the box, the free box, is based on Linux. And on Linux, you have already a 6 to 4 driver. What do you change between 6 to 4 and 6 RD? It's just that you change to uh, 2002 by something else. So you just modify a little bit the code, and you get a 6 RD driver. You put a Linux router here. But we'll do encapsulation of tunnels on decapsulation of IPv6 and IPv4. And this way, in three weeks, or five weeks, let's, let's say five weeks, free, deploy IPv6 everywhere on its network with a quality which is very, very close to IPv4. So what happens? So here, of course, we continue to have all the legal aspects that are respected by free. Because if a judge comes with an IPv6 address and says, this guy has done something bad, then inside the IPv6 address, you find the IPv4 address, and you know which guy it is. So the advantage of free compared to France Telecom is that free doesn't change you the IPv4 address. So all the time, you remain on the same IPv4 address. So it means that you have also a stability on the IPv6 prefix. So that's uh, one advantage. So free developed it. And now half of the traffic, IPv6 traffic on Google is generated by free. Because all the French customers may have IPv6 on their gateway, on their uh, devices, on, on their laptop. And so when they are going to Google, they are using IPv6. In fact, Google, when you have, so Google is here, you have a DNS server. And when a, a user asks for the IP address of www.google.com, Google give, except the, the six day, but on the other day, Google give only an IPv4 address. But if you register your IPv6 prefix on Google and say, I'm a good provider, I have a good connectivity with you, 
Google will test it. And when a customer here asks for Google.com, the answer here is different. You get the IPv6 address. And so this guy will surf on Google on IPv6. A guy that has an IPv4 address on a 624 address on an unknown from Google provider, then he will get only the IPv4 address and will never try to get connectivity using 624. So this way, Google solves the, solves the quality, of, uh, quality of service problem of these kind of mechanism like 624. You can have one address, but since the server doesn't use it, you will not see it. OK? So I propose you to, to have a break. We, we continue with what I said just before the break, is that here, all these mechanism, transition mechanism works well when you have IPv6 addresses, IPv4 addresses. For example, if I take 624 or 6RD, I put the IPv4 address inside the IPv6 address. And so it works. But if I have no more IPv4 address, how can I do things? So we, this becomes a, a problem because now, in fact, if you look at the transition way ITF, uh, the, the way the ITF think about transition, it was to say, in 1994, we start working on IPv6. So around 2000, we will have something that works well, and people will deploy a dual stack approach. So network will be IPv4 and IPv6. So IPv4 can disappear slowly, and everything will be in IPv6. And if you look at the first Revision in 2012, we may will have the problem with IPv4 addresses. But of course, nobody will care because everybody will be in IPv6. So that was uh, the plan from ITF, and the market will didn't do that. And in fact, they say, oh, it's working in IPv4, so I don't put IPv6. Oh, it's working in IPv4, I don't put IPv6. Oh, it's working in IPv4, then I don't put IPv6. Oh, it's working on IPv4, and I have no more IPv4, so I have to move to IPv6. But it's a big problem because I have to move to IPv6, and I have no more IPv4 addresses. So now I have two problems at the same time. But that's a decision from the market, and you cannot uh, <coughs> fight uh, against the market. So what is the proposal to reduce the use of uh, IPv4 addresses for users. One stupid way is to give you a IP private IPv4 address. And here you have your 192, for example, 168-16. And here your provider will use 10 something. 10 slash 8 for its infrastructure. And then here you put another NAT. And here you give a public address to that NAT. So this way I solve a lot of problems because here I need, I don't need any, uh, I just for with only one public address. I can con uh, connect a lot of customers. So this is one, one possibility. But, and of course, here you see, you remember that if I take a conic, uh, restricted NAT for one IPv4 address of a server, so I have uh, one IPv4 address public of server, I can allocate one of the ports. So, so if someone is going to a Google server, I can have up to uh, 6,500 connection to that server on this address using the same IP address. 
And if another user is going to another server, I can reuse the same port number, but here the server will be different, so I can make the distinction. So with a single address, I can connect a lot of uh, servers. But here, double NAC is very tricky to manage. And so people don't like that much this, uh, this solution. So another solution that has been proposed by the software working group is to develop what they call CGN. So how does it work? Here you have your edge router, so what we call in France a box. And what we put in the network, it's a NAT router here, like in the previous solution. And I give here a public address to that NAT router. But the main difference is here, I will use IPv6 to interconnect both networks. Oh. So it means that here, my provider network will move his network from IPv4 to IPv6. So one first advantage of doing that is that here you don't need any more IPv4 addresses. IPv4 addresses can be given to new customers. Of course, it's not a lot of addresses, but since the address now is a scarce resource, it's, it's good to, to get. So, suppose, and for the customer, it will, at the first look, it will not change anything. Because here, I have my uh, laptop, and I get a prefix, let's say 192.168.11 slash 24. Okay? And when I do that, of course, another customer will have, let's say, another customer here, so I have my box here, and it will have the same network with a laptop here, 192.168.1.1. Okay, this is uh, like you are doing right now. In right now, what you do, you have a NAT, and your NAT change your private address to a public address. Here, what we are going to do is to tunnel this, so the packet arrives here on IPv4, and in fact, here we are going to tunnel it to the box, to the CGN. A carrier grade NAT. So here, what will happen is that two packets will arrive here to this CGN. So the CGN will have to do something different because here, for example, these two laptops are going to Google website. So this one will have this private address, 192.168. 1, 1, use the port number, let's say 22222, and we'll go to Google and port 80. This one will go to have this address, 192.168.1.1, we'll use the port number, let's say that it will use the same, and we'll go to Google and port 80. So here, the packets that arrive at the CGN are exactly the same, the IP4 packet. So how can you make the distinction between this flow and this flow? Yes. Here we will have two different IPv6 addresses. So it's the IPv6 one and IPv6 address two. So, what will be the context here for the NAT? It's to memorize, of course, the private 
address IP for address the private port number and the IPv6 address of the box and here it's one side of the NAT and on the other side you have to use memorize the public address of the server and the public port number you are using. So here, for example, the first one, the first flow will be translated to Google by uh, my public address. And for 20, uh, let's say, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, to Google port 80. And the second flow will be public address port 12346 to Google port 80. Okay? So when Google will answer, it will say Google port 80 there toward public 12346. So I look here at 12346. And I get here the IP address of the box to which I have to, uh, to send the IPv6 packet. And here the trans uh, translation I have to, done on to do on the IPv6, IPv4 packet to change the public address to the private one and the private port number. Okay, so my NAT context will be a little bit more complex because it will include the IPv6 address of the box. So this is one proposal that is uh, right now quite popular by providers. For example, France Telecom is pushing this solution for the transition mechanism. So it's really a transition mechanism because the side effect of this is that IPv6 goes to the box and thinks, since IPv6 goes to the box it's quite easy to give IPv6 to the customer and this way the customer will be dual stack he will continue to have IPv4 a limited IPv4 with a lot of constraints but it will be still IPv4 and if you want to do uh, web surfing it will work and it will have a full access to IPv6. So new services can be running on IPv6. So this way we introduce the dual stack by changing first the provider network and then the customer network. So this is one, uh, one possibility proposed uh, by, uh, by CGN. So of course there is some drawback. The first drawback is that Normally, in your network, you don't have only PCs. You have also some other devices, like, what do you have in your home? TV. Hmm? TV, yeah. What else? Home. Yeah. You're very serious, guys. Yeah. You don't have Xbox, Wii, or... <laughs> so, on your network, you have, for example, Xbox, or Wii, or this kind of thing. And what you want to do, of course, is to play with other people. So, how you do right now? Right now, you have a protocol called UPnP. And UPnP protocol is is used to create a context in a box. So, for example, right now, you want to receive packet for a game. So what you say, okay, you say, when you re I read on the context, when it's for port, let's say, two, three, four, five, six, then you have to send it to two, three, four, five, 
six on this address, 192.168.12. And so you send this information, the public address and this port number to your other partners, and the partners will send you information. So this way you can play with other people using, even if you are behind a NAT. So the problem is that right now, so EPNP is using broadcast messages here on the network to talk with the gateway. The problem is that right now the gateway is no more, the NAT is no more here, but the NAT has moved to the CGN. So you have to develop a new protocol called PCP, Port Control Protocol, that will take UPnP messages and will discuss with the CGN to allow you to get a port number and publish it to get other people uh, to play with you. So you have to develop this thing. Second thing you, you have to do, for example, in your home, you want to put a web server. So currently, what do you do with your netbox? You say, when I receive packet on port 80, I send them on port 80 on computer 192.168.13. And this way, you are able to get uh, people access to your web server because you have a public address right here. Now it's no more the case. So you have two choices. One is to say, OK, I don't care about IPv4 people. They are stupid. I want just to focus on IPv6. And I will put my uh, server in IPv6, and I have a public address. It will be fine. But your grandmother is still in IPv4, and so you have to maintain the compatibility with IPv4. So here, you will have a possibility to accept to a web page on your CGN, and on with this web page, you will be able to configure a port number, let's say 44444, to your web service, web server. But of course, you cannot take 80, because you are sharing the address, the same IP address, with plenty of customers. And you have only 180. So all the customers cannot have the, the same port number. So that's a problem. So it means that now, when you will have to give your IP address to your grandmother, you have to say, my IP address, www.myhome.com, colon, 44444, to allow her to get access to your web page. So it means that it's becoming a little bit more complex in, uh, in IPv4 when we are using CGN. The other problem we, we have is, for example, the provider is offering you a mail server, mail service. So here, you have your mail server or mail relay that has been installed by your provider. And this way, you can post mail. And then the mail are sending to um, a customer. But usually, here you have a laptop, and maybe your laptop, laptop has a virus on it, and you have a bot that is sending advertisement for Vi Viagra. You don't know it, but it's sending. So it means that here, your provider normally watch your mails, is using some tools to recognize if it's a normal mail or a spam. And if it's a spam, it will decrease the rate you are sending mail. Generally, it will not block you, but we say, OK, you will not be able to send one mail per minute, but one mail every 10 minutes. So it doesn't block you, really, but it blocks 
the spam service. But what is funny right now, that of course this part of the network, this part of the provider is totally different from the access part. So here it's everywhere on your country that you have this kind of access and you have only one mail server for all the customers and they are not managed by the same people. So what happened? You have this guy that is sending spam. So the IP address of uh, the IP address will be used to identify the customer and say, okay, I block this IP address and I don't allow him to send in more than one mail every minute. The problem that this guy here is totally innocent and is sending mails, but his rate will be decreased because another one that shares the same address as him is spamming the system. And here it's very difficult to solve this kind of problem because here what you have the IP address and in the rest of the system you take the hypothesis that one user one IP address and it's no more the case so I don't know if in France you have heard about Adopi you don't know you stay one month in, one month in France and you have never heard of Adopi so Adopi is, uh, how can I say, uh, a law that uh, obliges or allow some company to look at peer-to-peer uh, -peer traffic, to look at IP addresses, and if we take this IP address to download the music or movies, then this IP address, uh, this person will have his uh, internet access cut for a certain period of time. So that's the, uh, the law. And of course, here it's very funny because if one user is downloading, playing on peer-to-peer -peer and download movies, then what will receive Adopi is the IP address of a group of users, and not only one user. And of course, if we cut the access to this uh, to this to that address, then you cut the complete neighborhood of internet access. So it means that here you cannot authentify a user only by its IP address, but you need more parameters. So that makes things more complex, because for example, you need, of course, the port number. If I have the IP address and the port number, I can recognize someone, but of course the port number will not be allocated always to the same person. So I have to get also time. Time at which uh, when the capture has been made. Because this way I can have a log, look in the log here, look in the log here and find at uh, 4 p.m. the port number X was given to that person. But it means that the provider here has to memorize all the flows that have been sent on the network. In a traditional way, for example, France Telecom say, I give this IP address to this guy for three, three days. <coughs> so it's only one entry for three days in a log. Here, it means that the log has to memorize all the allocation. And of course, you have also some problem of privacy because if you memorize too much information, we can say that you have been surfing this website, this website, this website, website which is illegal. So it means that it's this kind of thing makes uh, the network very funny in the coming years because it changed a lot of way you manage things. And I think it's something you have to, to remember from classes is that IP address is not only something to forward but it's used at different level to identify things. And even if we know in theory that it's not done for that, in practice it is, it is used for that. And so here it creates a, a lot of problems. So just to, to look at another solution, so this one is very popular and you have a manufacturer that are implemented the, 
uh, these kind of things. Now, if we look at another proposal that uh, is currently studied at the IETF, and this proposal is called 4RD. So, for RD. So you know what RD means for. So it's not rapid de uh, deployment here because uh, Remy deploy yes, but no, it's not the good here. It's residual deployment. So residual deployment, it's, so it's just a proposal that is currently uh, made at the IETF, but it's quite popular, and especially in Japan, a lot of providers are interested by this, uh, this technique. So the idea is the same. So we keep the same architecture, which means that you have your home network, you have a box here, and you, are, you, you have your provider networks, that is IPv6 only. And you have a middle box here, in the middle of, middle of your provider network, that will do tunnels with your box here. The main difference is that in CGN, the NAT was located here. In 4RD, uh, uh, the NAT continue to be on the box. But the main difference is that we are going to restrict the port range you can use. For example, let's say that people between a port between 0 and 1,023 will be allocated to user 1. Port between 1,024 and 2,047 will be allocated to user 2, etc., etc. So how do you do that? In fact, a port number is based on 6 bits. What do you do? Is you force the value of the more significant, uh, significant bit. So if I have 0, 0, 0 here, I will be between 0 and 123. If I have 0, 0, 1 here, I will have 124 x So this way I can force the, the range I use. And since I'm limiting the range, I can use the same IP address because there we, we will have no conflict between users because they don't use the same port number. So this way, when you have a NAT here, what you have to do is, oh, when the packet comes, what you will do is to look at the port number you receive and part of the IP address, IP4 address, and this way, you will guess the IPv6 address. So let's just take a, an example. So one proposed uh, C4RD is that if I'm talking, taking my IPv6, so here I have my global prefix. From my global prefix, I take the last bit of this prefix. So I have what I call here an index. And I will use this index to fulfill an IPv4 address. So here I have an IPv4 prefix that is public IPv4 prefix that is, has been assigned to my NAT, for example, through DHCP. So I know the value, let's say 192.108.108. OK. And I take here. 8 bits, uh, sorry, uh, 108, uh, 199, like this. And I take 8 bits from the IPv6 address to create 
the IPv4 public address. And I take the last eight bits to start the port value with this bit. So this way, you have two configurations. First, you give to the box the size of the index. You give to the box an IP4 prefix. <coughs> so you know from here how many bits you have to take to create your IP4 address. And the remaining bits are used as mandatory bits on your port value. So what's the advantage of this? Is that here it's context free. You remember in CGN, you have to memorize all the flows you have. And since this device is in the core network, you will have a lot of flows, and you have more throughput, more, uh, yes, more throughput than in a box which is just in ADSL. Here you are in the core network, and you have a cost traffic from a lot of customers. Here, so you have a context, and you have to find to find the IPv6 address where you have to send the information. You have to look at the public port number, look into a table, and find the IPv6 address. Here, it's totally algorithmic. It means that I receive here a packet. This, address, this packet has a public address and a port number. I just take this information for the public address and the port number to create my index. And this way, I create my IPv6 address and I tunnel the information to the box. So this has some advantages, is that the process is much, much simpler because here is just a tunneling mechanism with some algorithmic, but no lookup, no databases. Then a user is authentified by this value, which means that I don't have to, if a judge, of course I have to continue to remember a port number, port range, because I'm sharing my address with plenty of users. But if a, a judge tells me that this IP address on this port number has been committed a crime, then I just have to look at this, and this way I recognize the IP v6 address of a user, and I look at my authentication database for this IP v6 address, and I know the, the user. So it's something more automatic than, and it's more stable than in CGN. I don't have to log all the flows. I just have to log EIP and port number compared to IP only when I am not sharing port numbers. So that's the interest. Of course, the drawback is that if I have a user that is using only 10 ports and a user that is using 2,000 ports, then, if I don't give enough bits to this one, you will not have in, in enough port number, and this one will waste port numbers. In CGN, since I'm dynamically sharing port number among users, it will be easier. But in fact, we made some measurement uh, in the mesel. So maybe during your stay, you I don't, I'm not so sure, because students are not more here, but we make some measurement and we can see that you consume about three, uh, sorry, 200, uh, 2,000 ports. So if we use, if we give no more than 2,000 ports. So if we give you 2,000 ports, most of the traffic, almost everybody will notice nothing because it's enough for a user. You, even if you are doing a lot of downloading, if you are doing a lot of peer-to-peer -peer services, you never go after 2,000 ports. So that's a way also to dimension, and something static can, uh, can work very well, and it's much more stable, much more easier to manage than something in a dynamic like CGN. So of course, currently, since some manufacturer has developed some CGN uh, box, or routers, then you will find it, or cards that you can plug in your routers. So you will find that, and the provider will start with this solution. 
But it's not sure that in the future if it continue on that way because it's quite complex to, to manage. So if we continue, we are just about to finish the slides. So here I talk about 624. I talk already about uh, So, just one important thing, if we go back to the company network, so as I told you, I don't recommend you to put IPv6 in your company network. If you want to do that, then you will have to answer this question, do I use stateless? Stateless means that I'm using neighbor discovery to configure IP address, or do I use stateful in a DHCP server? So normally the answer is use DHCB because you have a control and you know which user is using this IP address. If you are using uh, neighbor discovery, we already talked a lot about that in Mexico, you are losing your IP address. The, the man network manager is losing the link between the IP address and uh, the user that uses it. And that can be a problem. So that's why it's not very, very clear right now. We need more tools. And that's why I don't think you will find IPv6 in large network right now. But in home, it's the case. Because we have no more IPv4 addresses and users will need it. Outside of your company, it's important. Because since users are moving to IPv6, and you see that IPv4 is more and more complex to manage, so it's better to, to have this interface with IPv4. And you can do it. So I skip that because we already talked about that. You can do it, for example, using what you have done during the practical, a proxy. So here I have a IPv4 client that wants to connect to a server. So as you know, he will first query the DNS server, the DNS server will give the IPv4 address, and then you connect. Now, what you can do is to put what we call a reverse proxy. So you configure this reverse proxy to go to this HTTP server, and what you do in your web server, DNS server, is to publish the IPv6 address of the proxy. So, it will go here and say I want this page. And what will do the proxy is to convert the query in IPv6 to a query in IPv4 and this way your server can be uh, have the answer. So for example when we talk with a network manager they say I cannot put IPv6 on my web server because I have a load balancer and my load balancer is IPv4 only. So here is not a problem because you are before your load balancer and you generate IPv4 traffic and it can be load balance, load balance as any other uh, protocol. Another solution that works well, it's for mail and is to use SMTP, uh, sorry, SMTPS so to secure the mail. So when you are using SSL, you can do the same and it was very funny because at Telecom Bretagne, we had two mail services, one in Rennes and one in Brest. And at the beginning of the year, we move all the mail services to Brest. And we receive some mail that say, look, when you are going to move to Brest, it will be marvelous. You will have more spaces. It will be faster, etc. But we then don't talk about IPv6. So I just answer to that mail and say, but there is no IPv6. And so they say, ah, yes, we forgot to, to put IPv6. So we give to Brest the trick we are using in Brest, in REN, to have IPv6 on our mail server. So our mail server is still IPv4 only. But what we have is a S tunnel. So it's a proxy that is used originally to secure IPv4. So it means that here, a customer that wants to get use 
SMTPS or POP A, uh, or, uh, or IMAP S, what he will do? He will go to that proxy, and that proxy will cipher the information and then, or decipher it, and send it in clear to our real mail server. What you have just have to do is to publish also the IPv6 address of the server. So this way, an IPv6 customer, client, will go to that equipment using SSL, we then decipher or cipher the information and send it in clear or receive it in clear from the IMAP server. So it was a trick we are using in REN and we put it in Brest and we ask people to do it carefully. It means that first to put IMAP S dot IPv6 dot server just to test it. But they suppress this phase and put it directly in production. And the next morning, we got a message from the manager guy saying, oh, all my traffic from uh, student and, uh, and, and managed network is now IPv6. How can I stop it? I said, no, you don't have to stop it. It's at life now. You, you have a very nice traffic in, in IPv6. So you see that when you have all the devices, it's quite easy to, to move from IPv4 to, to IPv6. So these tools, HTTP, uh, Apache that can be used for HTTP, uh, S-Tunnel can, that can be used for HTTPS or mail service, allows you to offer some basic services outside of your network. So, in my view, the first thing you have to do in your company network is to activate these two entries, these two triple A for uh, mail and HTTP, and this way you can cover a lot of communication with outside. And then go further, but that's the first step you, you, you can do in your company network. Okay, so after that, of course, you have to manage uh, the user uh, usage. And that's, uh, that's all for, for this part.